just a little idea what I thought of. I've got absolutely no clue how to link it. Aha! Let's say there was a cougar town. What sort of person might want to move there? Well, they'd be the sort of person who had a family, who really needed the sort of space. Oh, this is rubbish. Some of these ideas really just need to stay inside. <laughs> Let's just review the thing, eh? This is really good. Yes, it is. But it wasn't always this way, quite. Yeah, the cougar has always been decent. Pretty good, actually. But it's never enjoyed the sense of esteem, of almost reverence, that's reserved for lots of Ford's other stuff. Most of which is considered class leading or thereabouts. So best handling family hatchback for the last couple of decades, that's the focused and most funnest small hatchback, Fiesta. And in the S Max, Ford has even got the only large MPV with a claim to vaguely dynamic um, dynamics. Heck, one of its cars even has a man named after it. This man, Mondeo Man. But the Cougar always felt a bit like a car that Ford made because it had to. Like, oh look, loads of people are buying cash cars. Quick, let's make one of those. And because Ford has a lot of good parts and obviously knows how to make a good car, the Cougar turned out all right. It's kind of like an album track from the band that brought you Champagne Supernova. Like, okay, but really overshadowed by lots of other really brilliant stuff. That basically applied to both the old versions of the Cougar, the first one and the second one. You may have noticed that I haven't mentioned the Edge, and that's because, well... How's, uh, how's the Edge? The Edge is fine. But it is just that. It's okay. If you were to, say, write a song about an experience of trying to find a brilliant Ford SUV in the UK, it might go something like this. The edge was actually fine, by the way. How are you doing? I am doing fine. It's fair to say that, on the SUV front at least, Ford really hasn't given us that much to make a song and dance about here in the United Kingdom of His Majesty's Great Britain. That's especially weird when you consider that Ford is American, and America is of course the home of the SUV. God's land of the sports utility vehicle. Well, that was the case until Ford came along with this amazing little fella, the Puma. In 2019, it came along and became the best compact crossover SUV on the market, in my opinion. Because it's both the most fun to drive and the most carefully considered from a practicality and flexibility point of view. So the question is, is the latest Cougar best personified as a slightly smaller edge, as in a workaday sort of crossover SUV, or as a bigger and more practical Ford Puma, which would almost certainly make it the best family crossover SUV on the market today? Yep. It's the... Nah, you know what? Let's build the suspense of it by going through the more workaday review type stuff now. Let's do trims, right? So typical Ford stuff in that it's pretty easy to understand and to explain. So at the base, you've got Z-Tech and Titanium, as in sporty and I don't want to say luxury because that's a bit too much, but then I don't want to say not so sporty because that sounds pejorative. Not that easy to explain then, eh? Oh well, not for me anyway. It is though, really, because it's split into two is what I'm trying to say. Sporty and sportier and fancy and fancier. Quite a distinction too, because the trims do change the way the car feels rather than just giving you more or less stuff, although they do, of course, do that. So here are the base highlights, the Z-Tech highlights, and honestly, a lot of this stuff could have been on the options list. For example, wireless phone charging, navigation, and keyless start. But get yourself a Titanium. And that spec, in equipment terms at least, is a bit spurious, but again, thought of it, had to do it. <laughs> nice stuff anyway, right? So you get a digital instrument display. That's nice, assuming you would prefer that to old school dials, of course. But also, a power tailgate, stuff like that. It just feels like a lot of car. But then further up at the top level of the trims, there is a real distinction between the sporty stuff and the grandiosity stuff. 
So your ST line car has a different grille. It's got a body kit. It's got more aggressively styled wheels. It's got red brake calipers, flat bottom steering wheel. But then Vignali, Vignali, Vignil, that one anyway, that's full hoity-toity specification. Its vibe is altogether different. What's a fancy word for vibe? It has an ostensible air of luxury compared to the ST line car. It's got a different shaped bumper. And it has leather all over the shop, not outside the shop, but inside the shop. It even has a feature that I like to think of as the spoiled children facility. Heated rear seats. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've talked about spec far too much now. But before we move on, I will just point out how much standard safety kit this car has. It's amazing. And what that has led to is a highly sanguine safety report from the Euro NCAP Massive. This is a five-star car. Basically, it's so well specced across the board that you do wonder whether Ford is hiding something, doing the sort of thing that you would expect a budget brand to do, throwing all the whistles and the bells at it in the hope that you will overlook the fact that it has some fundamental flaws or it's just not very good. So is that what's happening here? Because it is a possibility, right? Given what I said about this car's predecessors. Nah, obviously not. It is absolutely raker, this thing, which is Geordie for mint which is Geordie for Belter, which is Geordie for Canny, which is Geordie for Good. Not perfect, and I'll come to that, but just so that you know, at this stage in the review, in case there is something far more interesting down the sidebar for you to look at, then this is one of the best family crossovers on the market, and it is everything that a Ford crossover should be. Definitely the Puma plus 20% that I was hoping for. So if you're after one, hit up Vanarama's website for the best leasing deals. And if you've not already subscribed, before you go, please hit that, the subscribe button that is, and hit the notification bell. That way, when we do a video, it'll come up on your phone and you'll think you've got a text message and then be vaguely disappointed, but you might still watch the video anyway, so please do it. Right, the reason it is so good is because, like the Puma, it is, in essence, a very accommodating and very thoughtful car. But alongside that, it is also many times better to drive than it really needed to be. As in, you will actually enjoy driving it. The space thing then. Now, it does feel like a half a size bigger than the other Cougars and quite a lot of the other family crossovers for that matter. But actually, not to the extent that it feels all giant on the road. So look at these pictures that I took outside the office of this and last week's Mazda CX-5 parked together. You probably agree that the Mazda looks quite a bit bigger or bulkier at least, right? But actually it's the Cougar here that's a bit bigger. It has slightly more space between the wheels and it definitely feels like it's got more rear leg room. But it does that while also feeling that little bit more compact than the Mazda somehow. It's an interesting trick. And generally it feels about the same size as all of these crossover things, as in Qashqai, 3008, Ateca, Tiguan. There are loads of these things now. The boot isn't the biggest in the class, Far from it, in fact, but I think most people will find it a more than satisfactory haul. My particular car has an optional spare tire, which if you do option it, sits under the boot floor. A repair kit is standard. What that means is that you don't get the twin floor set up. But regardless, the Cougar doesn't have the Puma's underfloor waterproof bucket thing, which I think is an oversight. Having said that, the hatch is wide. When you drop the seats, they fold completely flat. The luggage cover is designed smartly, so it lifts out of the way when you open the tailgate. There are bag hooks, which is just a simple bit of plastic, but such a brilliant thing for when you've been shopping. Highly appealingly, the rear seats slide as standard so that you can liberate more boot space to the detriment of legroom if you've got nobody in the back of the car and a big thing to carry. Slide quite far forward they do as well. Up here is where it gets a bit more hit and miss, TBH. Thankfully, the important bits are generally the hits. So the glove box is big and basic. It feels more like a storage bin. Cup holders are really clever. They're adjustable so you can secure your cup no matter what size it is. The driving position is perfect. And the infotainment screen is high set and generally pretty easy to use. Not the best, but not really frustrating either. There are dials and buttons for the things that you want to get to quickly, including one that says tune, like an old AM FM radio. It's quite quaint. I quite like it. To be honest, actually everything below the screen does have the feel of one of those crap old portable CD players that you used to get. It's got track change buttons and everything's all just really 
small and looks a bit fiddly and a bit naff. But more importantly, it has one of the most spongiest, most loveliest steering wheels you will ever hold. Shouldn't be surprised about that really. Ford has always done an excellent rim job. But again, it is hardly an awe-inspiring design in here. For me, it already looks and feels a bit old hat. So it's soft touch in all the right places, up here and up here, and there's even a little bit of soft touch stuff here where your leg might touch the center console. The elbow pads are padded. And I know that looks are subjective, but if anybody really genuinely believes that this is eye candy of any sort, let us know in the comments. I'd like to hear from you. Compared to the cabin of the Peugeot 3008, it's like comparing an old Dell to a MacBook Air. Same with the outside, to be honest. Now, the Puma is divisive, I know this, but it at least has a distinct aesthetic. It has that Marmite thing happening. Not many people look at a Puma and go, Neh. whereas it's very easy to look at a Cougar, in my opinion, and go, uh. Ford has played it safe here and ended up with something that's pretty bland and pretty generic. Now, it does look a lot better when it's tarted up as an ST line car, like mine was. The wheels and the body kit all look good, but let's go back to our friend from France. You would probably have to agree that the French car looks better. And if you don't think it looks better, it is definitely more interesting. And actually, the 3008 is arguably the Cougar's biggest challenge dynamically as well, because it's probably the only crossover that you would say genuinely gives this car a run for its money on the driving fun stuff. Arguably the CX-5 too, which is also really nice to steer. Having said that, I think that this has, well, the edge. It is way better than fine. Fundamentally, it's because it does feel like a tall Fiesta or a fat Focus. It has exactly those characteristics. It has the characteristics of the Puma. So it has a bit of dead in the center of the steering so that it doesn't feel twitchy. But when you really start to turn the wheel and you really start to feel what the limits are in this car, it feels so much more tied to the road than you expect it's going to be, especially given how high you're sitting. The thing is that somehow Ford has dialed out any sense that the steering is artificial. It has a real natural weight to it. I know road testers say that, like what is natural feel? Well, it's just a sense that you can sort of adjust the car like mid corner and know exactly where it's going. Like there's a direct link between the steering rack and the wheels. That's not always the case. Quite a lot of the time when cars like this are made to feel sporty, they just have over heavy steering. This really does have that feel of a Fiesta where the steering itself is light and easy to manage, but it also, in a strange way, feels unassisted. Shouldn't be the case in a crossover that. Or, well, it doesn't need to be the case anyway, because that's not what these things are bought for. But then everything else has the same sort of feel. So, I mean, it's not the best gearbox in the world. It's a bit long throw, but it's just really pleasant to use. It's not all notchy, it's nice and light. The pedal feels even better. Everything about this car has that classic Ford feel where it feels fundamentally well sorted out, really mechanical, but then also a little bit spongy at the same time, so it's all easy to operate. Firm at its core, but emollient at the same time. Just like there's a bit of foam over everything, that extends to the ride quality too. It always feels a bit busy. This is an ST line car, so it's on 19 inch wheels, which doesn't really help the fundamental ride quality. There's always that sense of pitter patter, you know, like the wheels are picking up everything. But then it feels like the damping is correcting it. The damping's quite soft. What that gives you is this sense, again, that you really know what's happening underneath you. You've really got confidence to drive this thing a little bit faster. But then at the same time, it's comfy. If you're just going along in this thing at 30 miles per hour, it feels quite soft, no problem. There are no suspension options on this car. You just get one set up. So the main thing that's gonna affect your ride quality is the spec or the wheels that you've got in your car. But I think even in this spec, big wheels, it is absolutely fine. What I would say is that if you just get a ZTEC car, something on smaller wheels, it's gonna feel positively luxurious. The same goes for the noise. It's really well damped down. This car actually has noise cancellation, so it has an active system that cancels out a lot of the tire noise, especially road noise. You do hear it, of course, but it does feel especially quiet in here. Again, especially at town speeds. I like it. It's really good and less interesting, but probably more relevant to your day-to-day -day experience with a car. It has loads of glass, this thing, so it feels really airy. You do notice that the side windows are really big. So on the one hand, that kind of contributes to it not really looking great from the outside, but inside, it means you get a lovely airy experience 
really good visibility all the way around. It is just a lovely day-to-day -day companion, this thing, in every sense. One of the reasons why it's so entertaining to drive is because it's lighter than the old Cougar by about 90 kilograms spec for spec. That's about the weight of me. And it's also a bit stiffer and you can really feel that. You can really feel that fundamentally there's a good chassis happening here. It's not perfect on the more prosaic stuff though. I can only really talk specifics about this particular car, but it has a problem that I have found with quite a lot of Fords and it's the way that the engine and the gearbox work together. This is the lower power diesel six speed manual gearbox and it is undoubtedly better when you're pushing this car harder. That's a very, very strange thing to say for a low power diesel crossover. <laughs> You'd really want it to be the other way around. The problem is that it just doesn't have a lot of low end torque and the gearing has been set up clearly for efficiency. It does work, so over the last 50 odd miles with this car, motorway, B roads, urban, I'm getting 52 miles per gallon, which is really good for around the doors and I've not been driving it particularly gently either. But it is one of those setups where you do feel like you're shuffling around the gearbox all the time. I'll give you an example. If you're doing 28, 29 miles per hour, the gear shift indicator will tell you to go into fifth. In that case, you're pulling about eight to 900 RPM and the car just feels like it's gonna stall. So you will end up doing this dance with the gearbox where you'll constantly be shuffling between third and fourth and fifth to try and put it in the right place and to try and save fuel. And it just never really feels very comfortable and that's clearly a little bit problematic for a car that will get driven around at 28, 29 miles per hour quite a lot of the time. Similar problem, if you're just about to come to a stop, you're approaching the roundabout or whatever and then you can go, if you stay in second, there's just nothing there. All the torque of this engine is right in the mid range and there's nothing lower down, which is an unusual characteristic for a diesel engine. On the other hand, it has more character than the average diesel and it is surprisingly good fun to rev out. So my advice for you, if you're looking at one of these, is to think carefully about really what you want from it. I know that's universal car advice, but in this car especially, if you're just wanting something that's spacious and it's comfortable around the doors, you might actually want to think about getting an automatic one of these. But if you've got a more interesting commute or you like driving a bit, it is worth getting a manual, even this low power diesel manual, but you just have to be aware that there are some compromises. True story, Ford just casually mentions in the press pack of this car that this engine uses rocket parts. Apparently they're designed to operate well at high temperature, but it doesn't really go any further than that. So you're just left thinking, well, how does that improve the engine? I could tell you that this is Vanilla Ice's hat, but that doesn't tell you anything about my rap ability, does it? So finally, the engine range. And this is another area where Ford's general sense of sensibility is advantageous to you, the prudent consumer. Just the one plain petrol, which I would suggest is the pick of the bunch if you're just going around the doors, you're using your Cougar as a runabout. Although there are a couple of plain diesels, if that's your bag, if you're doing higher mileage and you're really very concerned about good fuel economy and not going to the petrol station as often. And as I've just said, the basic diesel is much better than it needs to be. Although I will say at this point, because I didn't say it before, I forgot. If you're in top sixth gear in that diesel, it is running then at over 2000 RPM at like 70 miles per hour and it is quite drony. That is a drawback that I didn't mention before. But Ford has also decided that it's in a few different ways. There's a mid-level diesel with mild hybrid tech, which means that it gets a bit of an electrical boost, which helps with fuel economy. There's a petrol electric hybrid of the type that we're now calling self-charging for some reason. Although as you can see, it's hardly giving you groundbreaking efficiency and CO2 emissions. And it's also got a CVT gearbox and they're not the best. They're always a bit whiny. And for those of you who want maximum MPG and minimum CO2, there is a plug-in hybrid too. Now it is the same situation with the gearbox. It's gonna have a degrading effect on the driving experience and the general refinement. But look at those tax evading, no tax avoiding figures. Hashtag accidental partridge. Now I can't tell you what the hybrids are like to drive, but I expect that they'll have a bit of a wooden brake feel and the gearbox will be slightly frustrating and not anywhere near as much fun as the manual, but they will almost certainly still be more enjoyable than your average crossover because that is really one of the great triumphs of the Cougar, that it's one of the very rare cars of this type that doesn't feel like a massive dynamic sacrifice. If you have a couple of kids or you just want some space and you like to drive a bit, then this should be on your to try list. In that sense, it is classic modern Ford. It's taken Ford three attempts to get there with the Cougar, but third time lucky, Ford has managed to work out how to make a large-ish SUV enjoyable. 
Mission accomplished. Hey, boards well for that new Mustang SUV thing, eh? All right, we'll end there. Thank you for your time. Thank you for getting all the way through that, assuming you have. If you've not subscribed to the channel, do that. That's the international symbol for subscribe. Go to Vanarama for greatly steals, great customer service. And for a new lease of life, please have a look through all of the stuff. We've got some really exciting things coming to the channel soon. So do hit subscribe and keep coming back and I'll see you soon. Cheers, bye. Thank you.